So I am Jeanette Wing, and I believe someone was going to introduce me, but I'll just introduce myself. I am Jeanette Wing. I'm currently Vice President, Head of Microsoft Research International. I just joined Microsoft Research in January. Before that, I was at Carnegie Mellon University for over 27 years. So uh, basically, I'm coming from an academic uh, background. I also served at the National Science Foundation in the United States. That's a funding agency for research. I served at the NSF for three years, uh, overseeing all the funding for academic computer science research in the United States. So today I'm going to talk about computational thinking. I have this grand vision that computational thinking will be a fundamental skill used by everyone by the middle of the 21st century. By fundamental, I mean as fundamental as reading, writing, and arithmetic. So this is quite a grandiose vision. Um, and I, of course, it is inc incestuous in that it will be computing and computers that will spread uh, the uh, computational thinking. This vision is already playing out in research. If you are in any discipline today, whether you're in science and engineering or humanities, the liberal arts, your discipline is being transformed by computational methods, by computational tools, and by computational thinking. So this is a given. If you're a graduate student anywhere in the world, you are using computing in some uh, form or some manner. So in some sense, in terms of graduate education and above, in terms of any professional discipline uh, in any field, not just engineering and science, computational thinking is a given. My vision, of course, has grand implications with respect to education. What would it mean to teach computational thinking, for instance, at the K through 12 level? So in the United States, we, we talk about pre-college as K through 12, kindergarten through 12. So this is a topic that I will return to because I think it's one of the biggest challenges for our society in the future. I wrote a very short article in 2006. It's only three pages long. It is very easy to read, and I encourage you all to read it. It's one of those kinds of articles you can read just before you go to bed. It's a little poetic. It's not um, technical, but I think it's inspiring. So I encourage all of you to read it. So before I talk about computational thinking and why I think it's already influenced the thinking of all disciplines and the implications that my vision has for education, I'd like to talk a little bit about what I mean by computing and as a way to creep up onto what I mean by computational thinking. To me, computing is the automation of abstractions. By that I mean, in your head are these concepts, abstractions, ideas. Mathematicians, for instance, are, uh, think about lots of co concepts um, and ideas. But what computing does, it, it embodies and encodes these abstractions in your head into something tangible, something real, that you can execute, that you can animate. And that's what I mean by automation of abstractions. By an automation, I mean a machine, a human, or networks of humans and machines. And I will get back uh, to that point later. But I'm really trying to make computational thinking quite all-encompassing, because after all, humans compute. So computational thinking does involve the kind of processes that humans do as well. Now, what I'm talking about in terms of abstractions um, is really the core of computational thinking, the process of abstraction, the process of uh, taking a big system at hand, ignoring irrelevant detail, and focusing on only the problem of interest. This is something that computer scientists do routinely, and this is probably the key thought process behind computational thinking, the ability to abstract. Now, what I talked about here is really what mathematicians do all the time, because they're working in terms of abstractions in their head. But the kinds of abstractions that computer scientists build are guided by real-world concerns. How fast does this algorithm run? Um, does the system compute the right answer? Does it compute an answer at all? And all sorts of other illities, like simplicity and elegance, scalability, maintainability, and so on, 
All of these concerns, all these, these kinds of questions are what engineering disciplines do all the time. They try to solve real world problems, they build models, and then they actually design and implement those models. So computer scientists do that as well. So computational thinking philosophically really complements and combines mathematical and engineering thinking. Computational thinking draws on mathematics as its foundations, but we in computer science are constrained by the physics of the underlying machine. After all, we have limited memory. We have only so much um, processing speed, and we have only so much power, battery life, and so on, that we are resource constrained. Computational thinking unlike in mathematics, where you can have infinite domains and you don't wor worry about batteries running out and so on. Computational thinking all also draws on engineering since our systems interact with the real world. When you go to an ATM machine, you're interacting with a piece of software that's behind that machine, but you're getting money out. So there's an interaction between the digital world and the physical world. So there's an engineering aspect to the computer systems that you interact with every day. But unlike in engineering, computer science does offer one secret weapon, if you will, um, that distinguishes computer science for, from other engineering disciplines. What might that be? Software. In software, you can do anything. In software, you can build virtual worlds. And in these virtual worlds, you can defy the laws of nature and defy the laws of physics. And that's why people build virtual worlds and play in them and interact in them. So in software, you can basically build anything. It's only limited by your imagination. And that's one distinction between c computer sciences and engineering discipline and other physical sciences and, and engineering disciplines uh, that come out of them, like civil engineering and mechanical engineering and so on. So when I talk about computational thinking, I mean the ideas behind computer science, not the artifacts like the software and the hardware that we build. And I do mean that computational thinking philosophically is for everyone everywhere. So here, just to be a little more concrete, are some kinds of abstractions that computer science uh, majors understand and learn. And I don't mean for everyone to understand and learn all these abstractions and all these concepts. But I mean to be concrete. Um, I think everyone, for instance, can learn what an algorithm is. I think everyone can learn what a state machine is. And I think everyone in learning what an algorithm is and what a state machine is can benefit in whatever discipline they are studying. The reason I'm showing you, showing you these abstractions is to distinguish computational thinking from computer literacy, how to use Word or Excel. That's a given. People know how to do that. You don't need to take courses to learn how to do that. And I also distinguish computational thinking from computer programming. Computer programming is a skill that computer scientists use, but it's not the focus of what one learns as a major in computer science. So in summary, computational thinking is the thought processes involved in formulating a problem and expressing its solution in a way that a computer, human or machine, can effectively carry out. So all of what I said is way too abstract. So I'm going to try to get a little more concrete now. What I want to convince you of is that computational thinking has already influenced the thinking in other disciplines. And so let me start with one discipline that is currently being transformed by different computational methods, tools, and techniques. What one discipline might I have in mind? Biology. And this is happening. Um, some of the best work in computational biology is actually being done here in Israel. Um, and there are many different examples um, of algorithms, abstract uh, interpretation, um, abstract model and verification techniques, um, uh, representations of biological processes, all in terms of computational ideas, methods, techniques, tools, uh, and so on. And the, I'm showing you this list not to uh, try to, 
to bore you with a whole laundry list of ideas, but to show that this is a very rich and vibrant area right now in advancing biology using computational techniques. And I think the first um, example of how biologists uh, realize that computational thinking could help them advance biology is probably the first example I put on this slide, which is the shotgun algorithm expediting the sequencing of the human genome. Um, but in any case, some of the best work in the use of computational methods and the use of computational thinking in biology is actually happening right here in Israel. So what is common to all these methods that I list up here? What's common is that these are computational models and languages for expressing computational processes, like operating systems, like distributed systems. But it turns out that these models and languages are appropriate and natural uh, and applicable for expressing the dynamics of biological processes. And that's why there's such interest by the biologists for understanding these computational um, methods. So that's one computational um, one, one discipline, biology, that's been influenced by many, 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 many different computational methods uh, without my explaining each one. But let me flip the question. What one computational method has influenced many different disciplines? Anyone want to take a guess? Network analysis, that's a very good answer, but that's not the answer I'm looking for. <laughs> machine learning, how many people have heard of machine learning? How many people have heard of big data? Okay, well, <laughs> if you've heard of big data, you probably realize, or I, I will tell you, machine learning is the computational method that's going to help us analyze big data. Machine learning has already transformed the field of st statistics. Machine learning is in the sciences everywhere. In astronomy, machine learning is being used to discover new um, objects in the sky. Machine learning is used in medicine to analyze big data to help doctors diagnose. Uh, machine learning is even used in meteorology for uh, uh, understanding and modeling tornado formation. Machine learning is used in the neurosciences, and I think this is a, pr a pr especially appropriate for this conference because of the exhibition out there on the brain. If you go to that exhibition and you listen to some of the um, researchers speak about their demos and their projects, um, buried in many of those projects is the analysis of big data. And, the, and my guess is that some of them are using machine learning techniques to do that analysis. There's a, a colleague of mine um, at Carnegie Mellon, who has been using machine learning to analyze um, scans of your brain, fMRI scans, and realizing that you know one part of your brain will light up when someone's reading a noun versus a verb, or this kind of noun versus that kind of noun. And we're only beginning to touch the surface or scratch the surface of the use of machine learning in neuroscience, because after all, even the um, the instrument itself, the fMRI, is pretty coarse. So we have a long way to go as the instrumentation uh, gets more advanced. Machine learning is, of course, used outside of science and engineering. It's used in detecting fraud and credit card usage. It's used on Wall Street all the time, for good or bad. It's used in supermarkets, at least in the United States. You go to a supermarket, you buy things, you scan your items and you get these coupons in return. Those coupons are personalized for you based on your history of buying uh, habits. Machine learning is used in recommendation systems and reputation services. This is something that you probably use on a daily basis without even realizing. Machine learning is, has even been used in sports to analyze um, for coaches to analyze data of professional athletes in how they train, what um, uh, uh, yeah, ec uh, kind of exercises they do, and, and so on. So machine learning is one example of a computational method that has been used in all science and engineering disciplines and is being used in all kinds of 
day-to-day -day societal um, systems that we know of today. But let me speak a little bit more about computational thinking in the sciences and beyond, um, beyond just biology, beyond just machine learning. So um, computational thinking for many years has already been used in chemistry. And here the idea is to, um, rather than look at what nature provides and trying to analyze it, specify some, uh, uh, so some properties of what you would like some chemical compound to have in terms of specifying the properties, and then trying to synthesize some um, molecular structure or compound to satisfy the specification. This notion of specification, synthesis, implementation, and verification is routine in, in computer science. So that's an example of computational thinking in chemistry. In physics, um, I'll tell you this very short story in physics of computational thinking in quantum computing. It was a it was told to me by a professor at MIT who does quantum computing, and he has been working with physicists at MIT on a particular kind of quantum computer called adiabatic quantum computing. And the, he told me the story where there's a kind of um, way you in, um, set up your, the, your problem in some kind of initial state. And you can't really readily solve the problem in, in that initial configuration, but what you can do is you can transform it into a, 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 an equivalent like configuration and read off the, pro the solution from that configuration. And so the, the physicists know how to do this. They, in fact, can start with two configurations and um, there's a process that you can um, apply that will have these two different configurations basically converge towards each other. So this is known in physics, in quantum computing. The question he, as a computer scientist, asked is, how fast does this convergence process happen? It's a question the physicist never asked. But it's the kind of first question a computer scientist would ask. And he, as a computer scientist, was very interested in this question. Because if he could answer that question as a computer scientist, he might have a hint at the most outstanding problem in computer science called the P equals NP problem. And if he were to crack that, you know, he'd get probably the equivalent of a Nobel Prize, a Turing Award. So for decades, that problem has been open. No one has been able to crack it. Um, and it turns out that uh, it, it, it doesn't happen polynomially fast, which would have been fantastic as a result. But there's a window where it's exponential which means he didn't really have much of a good hint at the P equals NP problem. But after that encounter with the physicist, the physicist went around and looked at all the kinds of processes where convergence was of interest and started asking that question of efficiency. And again, this is something that's routine for a computer scientist to ask. How efficient does this algorithm run? In math, in engineering, uh, computing has been used for actually proving theorems that c didn't have proofs before in mathematics, um, and also, of course, in modeling and simulation and prediction. Um, for instance, the Boeing 777 was tested uh, via computer simulation alone. They didn't even use a wind tunnel. What about computational thinking for society? Well, computational thinking um, and economics, computer science and economics, is probably the most exciting emerging, fiel emerging field right now, where economics thinking is influencing computer scientists and vice versa. Um, this, is, uh, this is primarily true because of the electronic marketplace, ad auctions, keyword auctions, and so on, that are coming out of IT, the IT industry. Computational thinking in law, um, there's a, a story I would tell if I had time um, where uh, uh, the computational thinking is upsetting the patent industry. And computational thinking in healthcare, I think again, big data is going to play a huge role in how we um, monitor um, ourselves for our well being and our health in the future. Computational thinking in archaeology, there are programs out there that are digitizing every relic 
um, every cave, every museum piece um, for, um, for preservation forever. Computational and journalism, uh, I think uh, people realize now more than ever before that the whole field of journalism has changed because of digital technology. And computational thinking and humanities, again, there's a big data question here. When I was at the National Science Foundation, some people on, from the um, National Endowment of Humanities and the equivalent in the U UK and Canada came to visit me, and they said, we want to do a digging into data challenge. You know, what would you do if you could um, what, if read a million books? To me, I said, a million books? What's a million books? Why not a billion books? And then I realized if you lived to 100 and read a book a day, you could not even read a million books. Think about it. So to the humanities scholars, to be able to access in one fell swoop the content of a million books and to see and learn, and discover new patterns between language and history and art and um, uh, literature is, a, is pretty amazing and very exciting to the humanities disciplines. OK, so let me be really, really concrete. I think computational thinking does not need a computer. It's what goes on in your head, after all. And so we do it all the time. We do it in daily life without even realizing it. And so one should not be intimidated by my vision, because probably all of us think computationally already. So here is me at the National Science Foundation cafeteria on my second day. Um, I want to get my morning coffee. Uh, this is very important to me, because I cannot start my day without my morning coffee. And so I get a cup, and I put some milk in it, and I put some coffee in it, I get some sugar, and then a lid, and then a napkin, and then I leave. So to me, when I look at this coffee station, I think, ah, what do I think? How inefficient. Uh, it's especially inefficient if there's someone in your way. No, you're trying to get your lid while their other person's just getting his cup. And so you're waiting and waiting and waiting until the, the lid station is free. So as a computational thinker, I look at this and I say, well, let me make this coffee station more efficient. And there's a concept in computer science called pipelining, which suggests to me how I can actually effectively um, make this, uh, streamline this process so that it's more efficient. And actually, when I was looking at the station, I said, well, that, uh, what's the most efficient pipeline I can create? And, or I said to myself, what's actually the fewest stations I need to move to affect a pipeline? I was really thinking all these sorts of thoughts in my mind before I just said, well, let me just move the lids over. And then I have a very uh, streamlined pipeline uh, of stations. Uh, of course, I was very excited. I went to the clerk at the NSF cafeteria and said, you know, let me, let me tell you how to make your coffee station more, efficiently, more efficient. You know, just move the lids over there and everyone will be happy. And he looked at me, you know, didn't understand what I was talking about. Um, so, so much for my influence of computational thinking at the National Science Foundation. Uh, but uh, to, be, to be more serious, uh, although the clerk did not listen to me, um, my colleagues at the National Science Foundation really did. And um, in my first year at NSF, we launched a program called Cyber Enabled Discovery and Innovation. It started out as, at a $48 million um, program foundation-wide. Every single science and engineering directorate put money into this program. And it was all about computational thinking for scientists and engineers. By the time I left, left NSF, the budget request was $100 million. Um, I also uh, helped create a program at NSF on education uh, to develop competencies in com computational thinking for K through 16, both teachers and students. So now let me talk about the challenges of my vision. And this really has to do with, as I mentioned, not so much undergraduate courses and undergraduate education, but the K through 12 level. Um, let me first argue um, what the, the challenge is. Um, and that is, what is an effective way to teach computational thinking to K through 12 students? A different way of phrasing this question is, how, what is the most effective way to teach computer science to K through 12? And why should, why should one care? I do think that there's an analogy in mathematics that um, we need to understand 
what concepts can children learn at what age? Uh, much like in mathematics, uh, when you're five years old, you have a sense of number. By the time you're um, 12 years old, you, you have enough mathematical sophistication to learn algebra. And by the time you're 18 years old, you can learn calculus. We don't have an understanding of computer science uh, in a similar way. So there are already uh, many, many courses at the undergraduate level um, introducing computational thinking for non-majors. And there are many other schools in, the, in North America that are incorporating computational thinking or co introduction to computer science, again, for non-majors. Um, there's uh, a tremendous industry support for this vision, both for Microsoft, Google, um, and then internationally and nationally, there's um, a huge support. So nationally, at the high school level, there's a redesign of the advanced placement course and test to promote um, what I would call computational thinking, or it's called CS principles. Um, and there's an organization of high school teachers in computer science in the US that have endorsed uh, this kind of new curriculum. Um, there are uh, National Academy reports. And there's even congressional legislation sitting um, on people's desks. Internationally, I think I'm proudest of this achievement by the UK. In the 2012, the British Royal Society published a report um, basically arguing that every child should have the opportunity to learn computing at school. Uh, in the UK, school stands for K through 12. And they are making tremendous progress. They are, have a curriculum design in place, and all they need to do is really train the teachers to carry forth this vision. In Ireland, there's actually a bachelor's degree program on computational thinking. Other international efforts in Europe, there's probably more happening at the research level, uh, graduate level, uh, that I know about, on, and I'd be uh, uh, keen to know what else others are doing. In Asia, in Singapore, there's a program called CS Reloaded program, and it promotes computational thinking for master's level students. Uh, Latin America is just beginning to uh, start a network of universities to promote computational thinking. And probably um, the one that interested me the most was a young student from Egypt sending me an email message saying, I read your three-page article. I'm greatly inspired. I just started a blog called Computational Thinking in Egypt. Will you help me um, uh, uh, write to the Ministry of Education in Egypt so we can make sure that computational thinking is ta taught to all students in Egypt? I was quite an ask. I, I, I think the blog is, is uh, really inspirational to go to, go to and read. So my little three-page article was translated into Chinese and into French. I encourage you to, if, if, if you don't read, if you read Chinese or French and prefer to read those languages. Um, and so I'm going to close here with my um, main message of helping me make computational thinking commonplace, spread the word to fellow faculty, students, researchers, administrators, parents, teachers, and so on. So thank you very much. <laughs>